bridge tower. If was at the beginning. If he had been older, if he hadn't been dark, brown eyes ablaze in that remarkable face. If he had not been so gifted, so young, a genius with no time to grow up. If he hadn't grown up undistinguished to an obscure old age, if the piece had actually been, as Kreutzer exclaimed, unplayable, even after our man had played it, and for years no one else was able to follow, so that the composer's fury would have raged for naught, and wagging tongues could keep alive the original dedication from the title page he shredded. Oh, if only Ludwig had been better looking, or cleaner, or a real aristocrat, Vaughn instead of the unexceptional Van from some Dutch farmer, if his ears had not already begun to squeal and whistle, if he had not drunk his wine from lead cups, if he could have found true love, then the story would have held. In 1803, George Polgrain Bridgetower, son of Friedrich Augustus, the African prince, and Maria Anna Savinki of Biala in Poland, traveled from London to Vienna, where he met the great master who would stop work on his third symphony to write a sonata for his new friend, to premiere triumphantly on May 24th, whereupon the composer himself left, leapt from the piano to embrace his lunatic musician. Who knows what would have followed? They might have palled around some, just a couple of wild, crazy guys, strutting the town like rock stars, hitting the bars for a few beers, a few laughs. Instead of falling out over a girl, nobody remembers, nobody knows. Then this bright-skinned papa's boy could have sailed his 15-minute fame straight into the record books, where instead of a Regina Carter or an Aaron Dworkin or Boy Tinsley sprinkled here and there, we would find rafts of black kids scratching out, scratching out scales in their matchbox violins so that someday they might play the impossible Beethoven's Sonata No. 9 in A major, Opus 47, also known as the Bridge Tower. Windsor. I was told to practice out of sight in the servant's wing. I was also required to execute a gentleman's curtsy, deep as a girl's, stick the left leg out and sweep my arm as if whisking an imaginary hat from an imaginary powdered wig. I've always wanted such a hat with three corners and crests and a towering plume. Someday, father says, meaning be still. But I am so quiet from the shadows I can hear a maid's shushed giggle. I can listen to the concertmaster's muttered grunts and wheezes without once blurting, Papa Haydn wouldn't rush so. He says each note deserves its appointed terrain. I am to appear at the Queen's Lodge promptly at seven, make my gentleman's bow, and play the Viotti Concerto. So many glittering halls and secret passageways strung behind them to travel through like favored mice between the walls. Windsor. Every phrase ends with it, each whisper another wondrous layer, you're quite the lucky lad to be here, the feather in your cap. Boy, remember Windsor, and on and on, until the word grows its own breeze. Father's robe swirling as I follow. Hurry, boy, over Middle Ward and out the Iron Castle Gate. I can see the lodge now, a dim brown snag plopped square and dark across the longest path anyone could ever imagine. Struck dumb always happens the first time. It makes me think of ships, of travel, a line slicing the soft green, God's whip lashed straight down the heaving back of England, the long walk at Windsor, all the world at his majesty's feet. No, mine, in these pinch button shoes, all the world left behind. Not the world I am walking toward now. Disappearance. Kill the lights, cut the atmo. A boy and his violin, that's it. The one tucked into the side of the other. Both small, unremarkable. No, no, no. Add the pink jail. Until one of them moves, the boy lifts his arm, or the violin floats up to kiss his chin. Spot number eight now, a whisper of gold. Grow it and fade the pink on my count. Five, four, three, slowly, slowly. Drown the four stage. Let it seep in. A man can vanish between the downstroke and the first note sigh, from one word to the next, a wink and a nod. He'll evaporate under a lady's glance as her smile slides across the room. Do we want fog machines here? A little much, maybe, but spill some purple along the boards and back, then lift it up the scrim like a rising curtain of melancholy, an aurora borealis of the soul. I know, that sucked. You get the drift. But a boy looks out from the backs of his eyes. A boy stays where you put him, invisible, until you hiccup. Full floods, on my mark, 
Go. And suddenly he's there. Green, sight reading. Harder to play long than fast. It's more than stretching a line. Suspension is what we yearn for. That delicate fulcrum between crash and sheer evaporation, a dissipating breeze. To levitate strands of melodic sound across all the mired avenues we barge along daily. This shining wire, so light, so strong, we can just make out there, there it goes, and follow, slip note by note along, and fly, float, in that radiant web. Adagio sustenuto, sustained slowness. Not water, but the invisible current a dove's wing skims. Not air, but the agency that stirs it. Not light, but spark. No, the dark thread between sparks how your eye can read a firefly's glimmering trail while the rest of you is long gone, 
darting from leaf to leaf, touching down as the piano, poised to intercept that bright cursive, descends growling with a meteor deliquescence. He frightens me. I've never heard music like this man's, this sobbing in the midst of triumphal chords, such ambrosial anguish, jigs danced on simmering coals. Oh, I can play it well enough. Hell, I've been destined to travel these impossible switchbacks, but it's as if I'm skating on his heart, blood tracks looping everywhere, incarnadine dips and curves. I'm not making sense. You're making ultimate sense, he seems to say, nodding his rutted, heroic brow. The performer, adagio sostenuto, presto tempo primo. I step out. I step out into silence. I step out to take my place. My place is silence before I lift the bow and draw a finger width of ache upon the air. This is what it is like to be a flame, furious but without weight, breeze sharpening into wind, a bright gust that will blind, flatten all of you. Yet tender, somewhere inside, tender. If you could see me now, Father, you would cry. Though you wept easily, as I remember, and even so it was manly, the way that thick black fist daubed your cheek with those extravagant sleeves quivering, I prefer to stand. Cheek cushioned and soothe her as I pull the sobs out gently. Yes, you hear it, you who made me can hear it, just as he's making me hear it now, so that I can pull it from her. Adante con variazioni. Thank you, it was a privilege. You are so kind. It is all his doing. I am merely the instrument. You have the honor. Do you have the honor of this premiere? A beauty of a piece, indeed. What an honor. Countess, I am enchanted. I only wish I could better express my gratitude in your lovely language. Feel and dank. It's all his. Why, thank you, sir. I'm speechless. Gern geschehen, madame. Did I say that correctly? God, I sound like my father. I believe he is pleased. I sincerely hope so. But you are kindness incarnate. No, my privilege entirely. Herr von Beethoven is indeed a master, and Vine, an empress of a city, my apologies. I only mean that she is magnificent. Ludwig, get me out of here. Finale. If this world could stop for a moment and see me, if I could step out into the street and become one of them, one of anything, I would sing no, weep right there to simply be, and be, and be. Brother, do not spurk. Gloating does not become you. Forgive me, mother. The trip has idled my manners. Vienna was exhausting. Circles within circles. Oh, beautiful too, of course, but rather too falsely animated. Arrogance will with their archdukes and sandstone palisades. Yes, pretentious is the word. I am a fool. I have lost it all. He was great, is great. He hadn't finished the score, and the copyist nearly lost his wits scrabbling, scribbling madly the night before. My part? Oh, portions were illegible, but I didn't mind. I understood him. I merely listened and followed. He frightened me, but I followed. The concert was a sensation. I was feted. We went out on the town. Weren't we comrades? True brothers who can drink and curse the night through, yet swear loyalty all the more fiercely come morning. Yes, the gardens were splendid. Being further south, summer was already upon us, and everything brimmed with color. You could say, yes, brother, say it. The blooms were flamboyant to the point of insolence, almost unbearable in their profusion. Oh, I'm babbling. Pay me no mind. Eroica. A room is safe harbor. No treachery creaks the stair. I've locked the door. I will not hear them knocking. Anyone come calling can call themselves blue. There was a time I liked nothing more than walking the woods above Vienna, tramping forest paths to find a patch of green laid square and plush. I'd sit, tucked in a tapestry of birdsong, and wait for my breath to settle, let the sun burnish my skin until the winged horn of the post coach summoned me home. 
and then everything began to sound like the distant post horn screaming trail. I was careless then. I squandered the world's utterance, and when my muddy conspirator swayed and quaked like the tallest poplar tossed by the lightest wind, so that I could read his playing, see my score transcribed on the air, on the breeze, I breathed his soul through my own fingers and gave up trying to listen. I watched him and felt the music. It was better than listening. It was the last pure sound. My emperor, emptied of honor, has crowned himself with gold. Why did that savage say that? Why did I hear what he said? Why did I mind what I heard? Good days, bad days, screech and whistle. Sometimes I lay my head on the piano to feel the wood breathing, the ivory sigh. I know Lichnowsky listens some evenings. He climbs the four flights and hunkers on the stoop. Odd, I can hear his wheezing and not this page as it rips. The splitting, so faint a crackle. It could be the last embers shifting in the grate.
Thank you. 